Hi, this is Mr. Abbott, and I would like to review this season's uh, activity with you. Uh, the main question that we're trying to determine uh, by doing this is what causes the seasons, and what models can we use to understand the seasons. So if you are looking at Diagram 1, Diagram 1 is supposed to represent the equinox. The equinox is usually somewhere around March 21st or September 23rd. But honestly, the date can vary with leap years, with the, you know, time zone that you're in, etc. So usually it's on or around March and September 23rd. Now, if you look at the bottom, it says, on these two dates, the vertical ray of the sun hits the equator. Okay, on the left hand, on the right hand side, you see they have the vertical ray of the sun, which means that the sun's rays are coming from this side of the diagram, that half of the Earth will be illuminated and the other side will be in darkness. The position of the sun's rays determines the start and the end of each season. So when the vertical ray of the sun strikes the equator, that means it's either March 21st or September 23rd, it's the equinox. When the vertical ray hits the equator moving north, that would be the vernal equinox, the spring equinox for us, and that would be March 21st. When the vertical ray strikes the equator moving southward, that would be the autumnal equinox for us in the northern hemisphere, and that would be around September 23rd. Uh, you'll notice on the side that there are points A through H labeled, and it gives you the name and the latitudes for all of those locations. Now, if you look at the back of the page, the directions say for number one, lightly shade in the area that would be in darkness or in night. So, I'm just going to take my pencil and over here, this half of the earth is going to be in darkness. Okay, no matter what happens, 50% of the Earth is illuminated by the sun's rays, and 50% is in darkness. So I've shaded for this diagram, and you have to be careful, okay? 50% exactly half of the Earth is in daylight, half of the Earth is in darkness. Now, the name for that line that separates light from dark is actually called the terminator. And if you have a point on the terminator, it's either going to be sunrise or sunset. But step one, we shaded in that area of darkness. This line right here, separating light from dark, is the terminator. Step two says, on these two dates, there are blank hours of days and blank hours of night for all locations on Earth. Okay, the answer is... 12 and 12. The term equinox means or can be translated as equal night. And when you look at the diagram, no matter what line of latitude you're on, exactly 50% is in the darkness and 50% is in the, in the light. So every single latitude is going to be receiving 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of darkness. Now, in New York, okay, to get 12 hours, sunrise would be at 6 a.m., and sunset is at 6 p.m. So, 12 hours of daylight, sometimes called the duration of insulation, would be sunrise at 6 a.m. and sunset at 6 p.m. Not only that, on these days, it's the only days of the year when sunrise is going to happen due east and sunset is going to be due west. If you know azimuth, that means the azimuth of sunrise would be 90 degrees and the azimuth of sunset would be exactly 270 degrees. That only happens twice a year and those dates are the equinoxes. Now, for number five, we start getting into some calculations. For number five, it says, for the observer in New York State, letter C, what is the altitude of the noon sun? When I look at the diagram for New York State, it tells me 
an average sort of latitude for New York is around 43 degrees north. Okay, so right here I'm going to remind myself that we're at 43 degrees. Okay. When I'm trying to determine the noon sun altitude, I have to determine where the vertical ray of the sun is. The easiest date of all is always the equinox because the vertical ray is exactly on the equator. Now what does that mean? That means for an observer on the equator, the noon sun, if you're on the vertical ray, the noon sun would equal 90 degrees. Now, point C in New York State is 43 degrees away from the vertical ray. So to calculate that angle, all you have to do is determine the difference in latitude from the vertical ray and then subtract that from the 90 degree angle. So on my sheet over here, I'm going to do 90 degrees minus 43 degrees and what I would get is a 47 degree angle. So your answer here would be 47 degrees. Okay, the reason it's 47 is when you move 43 degrees away from the vertical ray, the sun is going to shift 43 degrees down from the zenith or directly overhead. Now, one little, you know, sort of formula you can remember is if you do 90 degrees, which represents the sun at the zenith, minus your latitude, that's always going to give you the noon sun angle on the equinox. And for this set of problems, that's probably the easiest way to do it. All right, now, point A is at the North Pole. Okay, so point A is at 90 degrees north latitude. You're 90 degrees away from the vertical ray. So for this one, I would do 90 degrees minus the 90 degrees, and what I would get is zero degrees. That means if you were on the North Pole on the equinox, the sun would be on the horizon. Now, just to make this a little quicker, point B right here is the Arctic Circle. So I'm just going to put 66.5 degrees north. Point C, we put in, we already did the calculation, but point C is at 43 degrees north, and we got the noon sun angle as 47 degrees. Point D is going to be 23 and a half degrees north. Okay, that's the Tropic of Cancer. Point E is the equator. Now, obviously, you're on the vertical ray, so you're going to have a 90 degree angle for the equinox at the equator. Sliding over, point F is 23 and a half degrees south. That's the Tropic of Capricorn. G is the Antarctic Circle, which would be 66.5 degrees south. And H is the South Pole, which is 90 degrees south. Now, when you're doing these calculations, you're going to wind up getting the exact same angle because the vertical ray is going to be on the equator. So, if I do 90 minus 66.5 degrees, I mean, if I were you, I would honestly use a calculator, but if I clear this, 90 minus 66.5 degrees, when I do that, what I'm getting is 23.5 degrees. Okay, so for these, for both the Arctic Circle at 66.5 degrees north and the Antarctic Circle, which is at 66.5 degrees south, you're going to get the exact same angle. Both lines are the same distance away from the vertical ray, so the noon sun would have the exact same angle. 
Now, when I look at point D, you're at the Tropic of Cancer. Okay, so you're at 23 and a half degrees north is the Tropic of Cancer. 23 and a half degrees south is the Tropic of Capricorn. Looking at our model, our diagram, you're moving 23 and a half degrees away from the equator. You're moving 23 and a half degrees from the vertical ray where you'd expect the sun to be at 90 degrees. That means that the noon sun position shifts 23 and a half degrees down from the zenith or from directly overhead. So if I'm doing that calculation for points D and F, which are both on the tropics, if I want to look at the math, I would do 90 degrees minus 23.5. You know, once again, I think you guys are better using a calculator, but if I do this 90 minus 23.5 and I get 66 and a half degrees. So this one should be 66.5 degrees. So for both the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, the altitude of the sun is going to be 66.5 degrees. Now, the South Pole is 90 degrees away from the vertical ray. So 90 minus 90 would give you a zero degree angle. Now, what's going to be different about the path of the sun on these two locations? Let's say I pick B, which is the Antarctic Circle. Uh, B is the, sorry, the Arctic Circle, and G is the Antarctic Circle. How would the sun look different if you were looking at from those two locations? To actually see that difference, I'd have to draw you a celestial sphere model. I'm going to draw it on the front. You don't need to do this, but if I'm in the northern hemisphere, the noon sun goes to the south. If I'm in the southern hemisphere, the noon sun goes to the north. So I'm just going to make a little celestial sphere model here. I'm going to draw north, south, east, and west. I'm going to put north on the right, south here, east, and west. You don't have to draw this, but I just want to give you an example. I'll do the same thing over here. Okay, I'm going to draw my celestial sphere model. The zenith is the point directly overhead. For this one, I'm going to do north, south, east and west. Every single location, no matter where you are, sunrise is due east on the equinox and sunset is due west. Let's say my date is 321, spring equinox for us, okay, and I'm at 66.5 degrees north. I'm, 20, I'm 66 and a half degrees away from the vertical ray. That means the sun shifts down by 66 and a half degrees. If I'm in the northern hemisphere, 23 is a pretty low angle. I'm just approximating that. But I would get a path that's exactly 180 degrees long. Okay, But it would be going over the southern horizon and that angle up or the altitude would be 23 and a half degrees. You always measure the sun up from the horizon, and that's going to be the altitude. Now, the same date, 321. This time I'm at 66.5 degrees south, so I'm at the Antarctic Circle. No matter where you are, you're going to have sunrise due east and sunset due west on an equinox. I'm 66 and a half degrees away from the vertical ray because I'm going from zero all the way down to 66 and a half degrees, which means the sun shifts from the zenith, 90 degrees. I subtract the 66 and a half. This time, instead of seeing the noon sun to the south, you see the noon sun to the north. 
So in the southern hemisphere, you can tell it's a southern hemisphere path by the fact that the path slants and the noon sun is over the northern horizon. Now that altitude will also be 23.5 degrees. You're measuring it up. Please remember that when you're recording the altitudes, there is no direction for altitude of the sun. It's just the number, the angle up from the horizon.